and welcome to week 8's lectures on Bram Stoker's Dracula. In today's session, I'm going to introduce um, the author, the novel, and discuss some of the literary context and uh, bring you up to the nature of this novel's plot. Bram Stoker lived between 1847 and 1912. The Irish-born writer Bram Stoker is best known as the author of the gothic horror tale Dracula. This immensely popular vampire novel also enjoyed great success in several versions as a play and as a film. Unable to stand a walk as a child, Stoker was bedridden until he was seven. Eventually, he outgrew his weakness to become an outstanding athlete at the University of Dublin. He worked for 10 years in the civil service at Dublin Castle, during which time he also served as an unpaid drama critic for the Dublin Mail. After making the acquaintance of his idol, the actor Sir Henry Irving, uh, Stoker became his manager, serving in that role from 1878 uh, until the actor's death 27 years later. This set of uh, details gives you a fair bit of context about the upbringing of uh, Bram Stoker. It also uh, establishes Stoker as the figure, as the author who wrote uh, this vampire novel, which was immensely popular with the readers. You can see how he outgrew his physical weakness. He becomes an outstanding um, athlete and then he uh, works as a drama critic. Um, if one can call that experience as his workshop uh, in um, honing his creative uh, and critical skills. And then he works as the manager of uh, the actor Sir Henry Irving. So uh, all these help him to uh, get immersed in the world of uh, writing. So Henry Irving is widely acknowledged to be one of uh, the inspirations for Count Dracula, which is why this actor is interesting to us now. Um, he is um, the figure uh, for him for whom. Um, Bram Stoker worked as a business uh, manager, so he is thought to have inspired, Irving is thought to have inspired uh, the, the title character of the 1897 novel Dracula by Stoker. Stoker's first horror story, The Chain of Destiny, was published in 1875. Um, the Snake's Pass, his first novel, was published in 1890, and in 1897, his masterpiece, Dracula, appeared. So Dracula is Stoker's uh, masterpiece. Um, Stoker wrote several other uh, novels. Among them, The Mystery of the Sea, 1902, The Jewel of Seven Stars, 1904, The Lady of the Shroud, 1909. But none of them approached the popularity or indeed the quality of Dracula. He died in London on April 20th, 1912. So, so Stoker is known as the author of Dracula. So Dracula is his most uh, important uh, work. On the slide, you see the illustration of uh, the first edition of uh, Dracula by Bram Stoker. It was published on 16th May 1897 by Archibald Constable and Company uh, in London and was priced at six shillings. 1897 was a good year for vampires. Philip Byrne Jones painting The Vampire was exhibited for the first time and caused a sensation with its depiction of a sexually alluring female vampire looming over a prostrate male. Rudyard Kipling, inspired by Burne Jones' painting, wrote a poem called The Vampire. Uh, the spiritualist and novelist Florence Marriott published a novel about psychic vampirism called The Blood of the Vampire and most enduringly of all, Bram Stoker's iconic Dracula was unleashed on an unsuspecting public. So 
the set of information on this slide tells you about the various narratives that dealt with uh, vampires. Philip Jones' painting is um, illustrated for you on the title slide. There it is. That's the illustration by the painting by Philip Burne Jones. Um, one can see that several writers of that period at the turn of the century um, addressed, discussed the idea of vampirism. Um, the authors range from Kipling uh, to uh, Florence Marriott. And finally, we have Brown uh, Stoker's classic uh, work, Dracula. In fact, um, it's, it's a bit uh, interesting to see the use of the word unsuspecting by um, uh, the critic um, here, um, it, it is slightly ironic because um, there are several narratives about vampires being um, discussed in the public sphere. So the public would have been um, prepared for such a narrative as uh, Stoker's uh, novel, iconic novel, Dracula. The cover design is simple but striking. We are talking about this... Um, Cover design. The cover design is simple but striking. Bold red lettering standing out against a yellow cover. Yellow was synonymous with the more adventurous and transgressive elements of the Victorian fin de siècle. It was the color used for the jackets of disreputable French novels. Dorian Gray in Oscar Wilde's novel The Picture of Dorian Gray is seduced and poisoned by the contents of a yellow book usually taken as being a reverse by the French novelist Joris Carl uh, Hussmans. We are focusing on the color symbolism uh, of this uh, novel's cover um, design. It has a yellow cover and yellow was traditionally associated with something that was extraordinary, out of the ordinary, adventurous and slightly outside the pale of respectability as well. So it was seen as transgressive. Um, and uh, this kind of color symbolism was particularly um, uh, relevant during the end of the century, Victorian fin the secular turn of the century, and in Oscar Wilde's novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, Oscar um, Dorian Gray is supposed to have been seduced by um, a, a yellow book, by the contents of a yellow book, and um, that work is referenced there on the slide for you. So one can see that this novel is um, using certain cues, certain cultural cues to advertise its contents for the reading public. The quarterly periodical, The Yellow Book, published from 1894 to 1897 with its distinctive illustrations by Aubrey Beardsley became the definitive embodiment of the transgressive spirit of the age. By giving Dracula a yellow cover, the publishers were deliberately aligning the novel with this more experimental and for many rather disreputable form of literature. So in addition to that narrative that we saw earlier uh, mentioned in Oscar Wilde's uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray, likewise, um, the yellow book itself, which was a quarterly periodical and published from 18... 1894 to 1897, um, there are suggestions of uh, transgression. It, it became the embodiment, the representation of uh, transgression, of um, rebellion uh, in that uh, uh, day and age. And um, by giving Dracula that yellow cover, the publishers were uh, aligning this novel, putting this novel alongside works such as The Yellow Book, uh, the book that uh, Dorian Gray reads, and um, other uh, work which refers, referenced uh, this yellow color to indicate its um, radical, non-conservative uh, spirit. In addition to transgression and the idea of experimentality, um, this 
color and this uh, this color had associations with the disreputable of course so um, it is experimental Dracula is experimental it is transgressive and more importantly it is disreputable and it is advertising all these qualities pretty loudly through its cues through its uh, physical cues Brown Stoker's novel Dracula, published in May 1897, is one of the outstanding works of Gothic literature. The story, told in the form of letters and journal entries, tapped into the fears that haunted the Victorian film the Siacla. In Dracula, modern progressive Britain is menaced by decayed aristocratic Europe. We see this work as belonging to Gothic literature. It has gothic horror. There are visceral descriptions of horror in this novel. So it definitely belongs to that uh, category of gothic horror. And it is narrated in the form of letters. Again, it's a gothic tradition. We are reminded of Frankenstein. Um, and um, very, very strongly of Frankenstein because it also is narrated in the form of letters and journal entries. And this work, Dracula, taps into the fears. It is addressing the anxieties that haunts the society at the turn of the century. And um, Dracula seems to be a novel that shows the attack on modern progressive society by a very traditional decaying aristocratic Europe. So, of course, once again, the Gothic trope of the past emerging, disrupting the present to cause havoc is um, communicated in this uh, novel as well. Superstition is pitted against science and wanton female sexuality in the guise of Lucy Westera is contrasted with the traditional respectability of Mina More. The book is an imaginative tour of the forest full of terrifying and dreamlike imagery but its roots lie deep in the anxieties of late Victorian Britain. The, this novel, this Gothic novel, Dracula, is profoundly a discourse on the cultural anxieties of uh, Britain, late Victorian Britain, um, and it is a fantastic and powerful and experimental work that deals with these um, ideas on the one hand, there was superstition. On another, we have science. Uh, we have um, excessive female sexuality being represented by Lucy Weston Rara, and the traditional conservative uh, ideas about respectability is represented by Mina Murray. So all these contrasts make this novel a very, very potent narrative. Now let's look at the plot of this novel, Dracula. A newly qualified lawyer, Jonathan Harker, travels to meet a client, Count Dracula, who resides in the remote Transylvanian mountains on the very edge of Christian Europe in the castle that has been the home of his aristocratic family for centuries. The Count wishes to discuss his planned move to London Harker soon learns that local superstitions against the Count have some basis in reality. Dracula is deeply feared and he seems to prey physically on the local population in some way. This is classic Gothic. Look at the setting. It is set in remote Transylvanian mountains. It is a landscape that is isolated it's remote, far away. It's almost on the edge of Christian Europe. It's almost alien. It's almost pagan. And we have a castle at the heart of it. A castle that has been uh, in the family for ages, for centuries. There is a count. And counts in Gothic literature symbolize terror, horror, evil, cruelty. And Harka soon realizes that there is some kind of uh, basis, there is evidence for the kind of um, superstitions that are associated with the Count 
he is somehow uh, exploiting and in, in some way exploiting uh, the people, the local population in some way, we, but we still um, are not very sure exactly as to the nature of um, the kind of exploitation that is um, happening. Harker succumbs to brain fever and can no longer quite trust his senses. Dracula makes his inexorable way to England, arriving on a ghost ship in the northern port of Whitby. The novel offers suggestive glimpses of how he begins to prey on a local beauty, Lucy, Lucy Westenera, who suffers a strange wasting disease that the professional men around her are unable to diagnose. Harker falls sick. There is a fever uh, from which he is suffering, and the fever, the idea of the fever, again takes us back to other narratives that we have read. For example, Catherine Linter suffers from fevers. So, fever itself has gothic connotations. Dracula is successful in his migration to um, England. He arrives at Whitby and he is preying on this local. A uh, woman called uh, Lucy. Nobody is able to find out as to the reasons for her sickness, and um, a lot of mystery is woven around the character of Dracula. It's only after Professor Van Helsing arrives with an expertise in occult lore as well as medicine that we learn that Dracula is a vampire, not just a figure of Eastern European superstition, but a horrifying reality. A creature that sustains a half a life, a half life for centuries by sucking on the blood of the living. Those drained in turn become vampires. Dracula is therefore the origin of an outbreak of a dangerous infection. Once Professor Van Helsing is on the scene, some of the mystery is um, explained. People realize that Dracula is, is a vampire and it's, it's, it's not just a superstition. The idea of the vampire is not just an Eastern European superstition. It's not just a figment of a wild imagination. It's not the stuff of legends, but it is a reality. This vampire sucks on the blood of the living and turns them into vampires. So Dracula becomes the origin of an infection, a contagious infection, a dangerous infection. The disbelieving men see Lucy revived and preying on young children after her, after her apparent death. They are forced to kill her using a wooden stake driven through the heart. The second of half of the novel focuses on Van Helsing and his friends working together first to expel the vampire from England, then to chase him back all the way to Transylvania where they kill him, securing victory for Christian Europe over a dangerous enemy. Now Lucy, who is preyed on by uh, Dracula, dies but revives as a vampire and she in turn is preying on young children and those around her are forced to exterminate her, kill her by driving a stake through her heart. It's got the horror there right in front of you on the page. The second half of the novel is about um, Dracula being chased away from England first and Van Helsing and his team um, track him back to his uh, home in Transylvania where they um, kill him, where they are triumphant in destroying him. Thus, um, victory is secured by Christian Europe over this dangerous uh, enemy, over this um, dangerous villain. Now let's look at the context, the literary context for this um, novel. The romance revival of the 1880s and 1890s more explicitly in relation to the fantastic can be seen as a context for this um, gothic horror. There are cultural contexts as well. Uh, the late Victorian world of imperialism and degeneracy theories, purity crusades and the new woman, materialist medicine and its opponents, continental psychology on the one hand, spiritualism and assorted occultisms on the other, all combine mm. to produce this uh, gothic horror narrative called Dracula.
North Fry states that the romance is traditionally a psychomachia, a struggle between the forces of good and evil in which evil is defeated and the modern romance sort of retains the Spartan. The urban Gothic extends the tradition in a peculiarly modern way by defining the enemy not as not only evil but unnatural. He, she, it has no right to exist at all. Kathleen L. Spencer draws on the idea of Northrop Fry in relation to the romance. The romance, according to Fry, is a fight between good and evil in which evil is destroyed. And, and the modern romance seems to follow this kind of pattern, but there is a slight change in relation to the urban Gothic. Where does this change come in? It comes in the representation of evil. This evil has no exist, a right to exist. So the representation of evil becomes problematized in Gothic literature, in Gothic narratives. This evil can be anything that is outside of the ordinary, outside of the norm. Let's, let's talk more about this concept. Dracula is a classic example of the conservative fantastic. In the end, Dracula is killed, the alien element expelled, and the ordinary world restored. But what exactly is being expelled? In particular, how would Stoker's original audience have read this novel? In the cultural context of 1897, what threat did Dracula represent that needed so desperately and at such cost to be driven out? What was the culture being instructed to protect itself and from what? The set of questions asked by Kathleen L. Spencer are very interesting. We are asked to think about the nature of Dracula. What is Dracula? What is it representing? What are the original audience protecting themselves from? What kind of a contagion is Dracula? Is Dracula a representation of immigrants? Uh, is Dracula a representation of the foreign? Is Dracula the representation of the non-Christian? Is Dracula the representation of um, you know, sexual uh, freedom? So questions proliferate in relation to um, the idea of Dracula. As René Girard tells us in Violence and the Sacred, what all sacrificial victims have in common is that they must recognizably belong to the community, but must at the same time be somehow marginal, incapable of fully participating in the social bond, slaves, criminals, the mad, the deformed. They are enough of the community to substitute for it, but between them and the community, a crucial social link is missing, so they can be exposed to violence without fear of reprisal. Their death does not automatically entail an act of vengeance. As a result, sacrificing them will end communal violence rather than prolonging it. Kathleen, uh, Kathleen L. Spencer is using the concept of René Gerard uh, in the work Violence and Sacred to uh, throw further light on the nature of uh, Dracula. This is extremely uh, useful for us because uh, we can also think through the idea of Gothic victims by uh, looking closely at this set of information by uh, Gerard. In a community, certain marginal characters such as slaves, criminals, the mad, the deformed can be safely eliminated. These characters, slaves, criminals, the mad, the deformed, are like the community, but they are not exactly the community because there is a missing link. There is a missing link. They are not the norm. They are not the ordinary figure in society. Because of that missing link, one can commit violence against these characters, slaves, criminals, the mad, deformed, and such violence will be useful to useful to the community where communal violence can be ended by by this kind of violence against the marginal figures so this is interesting for us in terms of how we address look at understand dracula 
Dracula is hunted down and eliminated and we are wondering, left wondering, what does this uh, character Dracula represent? Uh, what are the fears that are um, provoked by this uh, strange figure, this strange vampire figure? There are also other victims within this narrative, victims that are not uh, particularly um, the figure of Dracula himself. We'll come to that. Let's first look at uh, Lucy Westnera as a gothic victim. In Dracula, I argue, this I refers to Catherine L. Spencer. Lucy Westnera fills the category and the social function of the surrogate victim who is sacrificed to restore a lost order. On the surface, it would seem that Lucy belongs to the class Victorians would find least sacrificable rather than a most, uh, rather than most, a young, beautiful, virtuous girl, and that in any case she is a victim not of her own community but of a monstrous outsider. So on the surface, she is a victim not of her community but of a monstrous outsider. But let's uh, look further very closely at her character and make other conclusions. Um, so she is young, beautiful, virtuous, um, and she becomes a, a victim of an outsider. But is she uh, a, a, a victim of the outsider or of the community is something that we can um, think about as well. We are given numerous indications that Lucy, for all her sweetness, purity and beauty, is a marginal figure. In the first place, her social connections are alarmingly tenuous. Her father is dead and she has no brothers or other family to protect her except her mother who is herself very weak, both psychologically and physically, and in fact predeceases her daughter. There's no one to protect Lucy from attack or to revenge her death at the hands of her, of her community. So there are socially ambiguous contexts for Lucy Westnera. Uh, her father is no longer there, no brothers, and the mother uh, dies before her. So she is an orphan for all intents and purposes, and there is nobody to protect Lucy if uh, there is attack on her. So this kind of social connections make her a marginal figure despite her sweetness, purity, and beauty. More crucially, Lucy's character is flawed in a way that makes her fatally vulnerable to the vampire. She is a woman whose sexuality is under very imperfect control. She is loved devotedly by three different young men, which in itself is not a fault, but her reaction to the situation reveals a problem. When she writes to Mina about her sisters, she can't help gloating about three proposals in one day. So there is a crucial flaw to Lucy's character, and that relates to her sexuality, which seems to be and imperfect control. She is not in control of her sexuality. She is not in control of her purity. She is loved by three young men, but that's not the problem. She is happy about that. She can't help boasting about it uh, to Mina about three proposals she received. Nor is this desire to marry all three of her suitors the only sign of Lucy's suspect character. She is a sleepwalker. A, tra a habit traditionally associated with sexual looseness. She is therefore doubly vulnerable to Dracula's approach. In the symbol system of the novel, she has signaled her sexual receptivity. Worse yet, she goes to the old cemetery alone and to the grave of a suicide, the only spot of unsanctified ground in the churchyard. The traditional equation of sexuality and death could hardly be clearer, nor her invitation of Dracula more explicit. The third point against her is that she is a sleepwalker. She, um, she is somebody who is an orphan. She does not have any male figures to um, support her, to protect her, to take vengeance against her. And now we realize that she is a sleepwalker which is associated with sexual immorality. Therefore, when she goes to the churchyard and especially to uh, the place where uh, a person who committed suicide was buried um, and that is unsanctified ground. That's not a blessed spot. When she goes there at night, 
sleepwalking she is inviting the company of dracula so she is sending out all these cues which make her an outsider rather than an insider she is inviting the monster's company so all these social cues are significant for us to analyze the nature of society as well thank you for watching i'll continue in the next session